Sovereign money is a necessary condition for freedom. And truly sovereign money must be private money. As the sun sets on yet another fabulous Monericon, I want you to leave here with the conviction that these statements are absolutely true. We've already heard this rallying cry several times throughout the weekend. It was argued by some as part of a rational philosophical argument, while from others, it was more of an emotional declaration, an aphorism expelled without substantiation, but with the heartfelt conviction that it must be true. Many of you may share the sentiment. Hopefully, as we close out this wonderful, wonderful conference, I can brace that conviction with the iron support of simple truths and the steel bindings of inferential logic. To begin, I want to talk about what money and sovereignty are at a very fundamental level. If we break civil society down, and I mean really break it down to its most basic naked fundamentals, it is this. We, as part of our social contract with other contributing members, donate the outputs of our time and our energy to society. In return, we are entitled to a, an equivalent degree of output derived from the time and energy of others. At the end of the day, that is what society is. Now, usually, society places a greater value on the output of our time and energy than we require in redemptions for our immediate needs. And so, we are allowed to defer redemption of the products and services that are owed to us until a later date. Now, the means of tracking this ledger of debits and credits of our time and energy, or energy accounts, if you will, is more generally known as money. So for, the, for me, this is the most fundamental definition of money, and so it bears repeating. Money, at its core, is a direct representation of the excess time and energy that a citizen has positively contributed to society to be redeemed for the output of others' time and energy at a later date. So a brief aside. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, Bitcoin is stored energy, being passed around crypto Twitter the last year or so. In particular, Arthur Hayes, the former BitMEX CEO, for one, has used this phrase several times in his writings in the last year or so. And if you don't read his blog, you, I really recommend that you do. It's equal parts crass irreverence and deep macroeconomic wisdom. In fact, I've used this very phrase in talks and writing stretching back some four years now. So the relationship, if not the near equivalence of energy and Bitcoin, and in fact, any proof of work cryptocurrency, is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. But this expression has drawn some ridicule, particularly in some of the more dogmatic parts of crypto Twitter. Comments like, well, if Bitcoin were energy, I'd be able to charge my phone with it. And this comes from both the trolls and the well-respected laser eyes alike. Well, yes, that is technically true, but the pedants miss the broader point. Firstly, saying that Bitcoin is stored energy is far more pithy than money is the direct representation of the excess time and energy citizens contribute to society. So I hope I speak for Arthur too here when I say that we were hoping that people would connect the dots between a soundbite and the idea that we were trying to get across. But as usual, we underestimate the ability of Twitter's denizens to jettison rational dialogue in favor of trying to win a few retweets. So you may be asking yourself, why do we need this new definition of money? Textbooks already define what money is. Well, the answer is twofold. The first, as you'll see shortly, is that it allows one to draw a natural, logical conclusion about money and sovereignty. And secondly, that my definition encompasses the traditional definition of money already, in that it is a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. And I'll demonstrate this briefly. So firstly, that money is a store of value is implicit in the phrase direct representation of the excess time and energy to be used at a later time. This phrase is literally spelling out the meaning of the word storage. The fact that redemption is happening at a later date for others for the output of others' time and energy implies that exchanges are taking place. And therefore, this thing I'm calling money is a medium of exchange. And finally, unit of account. This definition does not specify the types of goods that are exchanged. Anything produced with my time and energy can be exchanged at a later date for any good or service 
produced by someone else's time and energy. This entails that there's some means of converting the value of disparate goods and services between each other, and by extension, is a unit of account. So now let's consider sovereignty and freedom. When I say that I, as a contributing citizen, offer my time and energy to society, there is a presupposition that it is my time and energy to give. In a free state, this would be true. So let me say this again. In, if I live in a state of freedom, my time and energy are irrevocably mine. And I trust that this is not a controversial assertion. As a corollary, we've just seen that money is a direct representation of excess time and energy. So I therefore make the case that in a free society, my money must also be irrevocably mine. Now, if we accept this statement as true, the contrapositive must also be true. And that is to say that if my time and energy, or by proxy my money, are not irrevocably mine, then I do not live in a state of freedom. Equivalently, if we can show that our money is not ours, we do not live in a free society. Now, do I need to make a case to this audience that fiat money is at least nowhere near and not even close to being irrevocably ours? I guess not. And therefore, my friends, it is evident that we do not live in a state of freedom as long as fiat currency is our dominant form of money. In fact, I would argue that we learned, live in a state of neo-feudalism where multinational banks and governments have replaced aristocrats and nobility as our lords and masters. Granted, the majority of the West does not live in poverty, in filth. We don't lose our teeth by 20 and die by 30. But we're not free. We have a well-fed, middle-class, contentment is good enough kind of subjugation. Like the populace in Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World, we are fed enough soma to keep us medicated, passive, and distracted enough not to realize that the bulk of our time and energy has been ceded to the political and financial classes. Our money may be nominally ours, but as the Cypriots discovered in 2012, when they woke up to discover that their government had simply taken 10% of their bank balances overnight, or Canadian truckers exercising their right to peaceful protest found that their assets had been frozen, Every day, people are finding that their banks ac bank accounts are closed and sometimes seized with no explanation or recourse because they contribute to society in ways that are not illegal, but are considered distasteful un or unworthy, where it be marijuana cultivation, sex work, or building freedom technology. I suspect that this sentiment resonates with you on an emotional and maybe even visceral level. But let's be clear, I have not pulled this conclusion out of thin air as part of a conspiratorial rant. Although it may be a rant, it is not a conspiratorial one. This conclusion was based on only two axiomatic statements. Firstly, that money is a direct representation of the product of our time and energy. And secondly, that a free society is one in which my time and energy are irre irrevocably mine. So if you can accept these two statements as axiomatic, the rest follows absolutely logically. Fiat money is not sovereign. Is Bitcoin sovereign? So to answer this question, we need to ask ourselves, is my Bitcoin irrevocably mine? Given the amount of computing power available today and the current state and trajectory of the advancement of AI, I think we need to assume at this point that the Bitcoin network is 100% surveillable. If you have made any transactions that link your identity to Bitcoin, you may as well assume that all of your Bitcoin transactions for all of time are completely transparent and attributable to you. I'm therefore going to speculate, so, you know, reaching into the realm of speculation now, that Bitcoin eventually gets the blessing of our lords and masters. They will put up the appearance of fighting Bitcoin, wagging their fingers and saying, stay away. But then they will mag magnanimously concede that, yes, okay, you know, you guys deserve your freedom. You deserve some liberty. You can have your cryptocurrency. 
Bitcoin has our blessing. Because at that point, Bitcoin will have been completely co-opted and no longer truly sovereign. In fact, this may already have happened. If we look closely, they are really only fighting anti-surveillance measures on Bitcoin now. Samurai Wallet, Uniswap, Tornado Cash. There is some posturing against centralized exchanges, but ultimately, the anointed few will remain in business under the watchful eye of the masters, I mean regulators. Ultimately, they are going to be controlling all of the on-ramps, the off-ramps, and they're going to be herding Bitcoin into a handful of pens like centralized exchanges and ETFs. And before long, this gives the authorities the power to freeze or even seize your Bitcoin. Even if you stay completely within the system, because the network is 100% available, the government will be able to under identify individual UTXOs and then pressurize miners to blacklist them. And we are already seeing this play out in practice. So even though it is true that Bitcoin is decentralized and censorship resistant, I mean, and, and we love Bitcoin and we owe a lot to Satoshi for bringing us, it to us, its open nature makes it inherently weakly self-sovereign. Add to this, privacy technology on Bitcoin stands out like a lake in the desert and makes it an easy target for the lords and masters of our neo-feudalist state. You don't have to shut down or ban Bitcoin if you can subvert and control it. And as this plays out, the price of Bitcoins could still reach a million dollars. But I would say that it is a failed project. It is the lack of built-in privacy that is Bitcoin's Achilles heel. Without, without privacy, you cannot have sovereignty. Without privacy, it is impossible to exercise your right to property ownership, which was the thesis of Andrea's talk yesterday afternoon. Privacy is a necessary, if not, may not be a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition for sovereign money. So this brings us to Monero. Is Monero self-sovereign money? In Monero, you cannot, with anything above a very small probability, analyze the public blockchain data to determine the parties involved in a transaction. And once full membership proofs go live, this will be nigh impossible. The value of every UTXO or coin or e-note or whatever you want to call it is encrypted. And there is no way of knowing whether a given output has ever been spent or not. Every e-note looks the same. They have not been tarred or blemished by their history and therefore cannot be used to discriminate or target your opponents, whether they be political or ideological. The biggest threat to your privacy in Monero is when you use KYC off-ramps into the neo-feudalist finance system, which is unavoidable at times. So when you do so, I highly recommend that you render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and remain within the laws and obligations of your fiscal jurisdiction. Ideally, you keep within the circular private economy as far as possible. And I hope that you stick around for Ryan's talk directly after this one to get a flavor of the type of offerings that already exist in the circular economy today. So while not perfect, I believe that Monero is the closest thing that we have to sovereign money. And if you believe, like me, that our current neo-feudalist state is an unjust one, you should really be thinking hard about how to invest the majority of your excess time and energy into Monero. So let me sum up my arguments in six short sentences so you can print them out and show them to your friends and family. Money is the, is the direct representation of the product of our time and energy that we contribute to society. We are not free if our time and energy, and by extension our money, is not irrevocably ours. Society is therefore evidently not free today, since fiat money is the dominant coin of the realm, and that coin is owned by our neo-feudalist masters, the banks and the state. Four, privacy is a necessary condition for self-sovereign money, although not necessarily a sufficient one. Bitcoin is not private enough, so be careful. Monero is as close to sovereign money that we have today, and so as a practical matter, Monero is a prerequisite to freedom. I want to add a short epilogue, if time permits, and there are a few minutes. So I want to say, 
eventually people will start waking up from their ambient induced comas and come and join us. At first, these will be refugees from the land of Eth and Seoul that have had their assets frozen, their friends jailed, and their livelihood ruined once the ringmasters of the Number Go Up Circus have packed up and left them with nothing. Except the realization of what we already know here today. For them, it'll be an expensive lesson. But they will come here, and they will come with expectations. They will be wanting their DeFi, their tokenized real-world assets, their non-fungible monkey JPEGs. You can chuckle, but these are really, really important tools in the world of decentralized and democratic finance. Well, maybe not the monkey JPEGs, but I mean, I think certainly everything else. I think it's ridiculous that in the United States, you can only invest in early stage companies for potential 100 baggers, irrespective of how much knowledge you have or your risk appetite, unless you are already a demonstrated millionaire. I myself got denied a mortgage because the bank's compliance department found out that I worked in crypto. This is a true story. The current state of finance and banking is a state of class division and inequality. I've used this term ad nauseum now, but it is so apropos. We live in a state of neo-feudalism. So these tools need to be built, but they will never be built on Monero itself. Monero's ethos is a noble one. It is to do one job, and to do that one job as best as it possibly can, and that is free and private money. So it's up to the rest of us, and like-minded projects like Tari, who deeply understand and commit to the ideals of Monero to build a free and neutral financial system around it. Personally, I am biased because, and I like Tari because I spent five years designing and helping build it. And so I encourage you to go and check it out, but also look at the rest of the ecosystem and what the amazing people at this conference have built together with us. And finally, I hope to see you all again next year. Thank you.